I do believe that uh, the same God that created those beautiful scenes is capable of making something beautiful of uh, your life, like Richard was sharing. Amen. Amen. And that's a powerful testimony. Okay. Uh, Last week, I responded to John MacArthur's statement on social justice. As you know, this is part, uh, and, and so this is part two. Uh, to, to sum up, I challenge MacArthur's statement because I do not believe what he uh, claims is biblical justice is in fact biblical justice. Uh, in fact, I uh, decried it as anti-biblical. In doing so, I referred to Jesus and some other texts out of the Bible, but rather tangentially. After the message, uh, Danny came up to me and said, you know, I'd like to hear more about what Jesus said about justice. So, you know, when Danny speaks, uh, you should listen. And, uh, and I listen. So uh, this, this is extending uh, that uh, message, uh, part two, if you will, uh, a follow-up, since the, uh, this series has to do with the historical, why the historical Jesus matters to people of faith, and especially in this case, in terms of a major biblical theme, justice. Uh, now, to answer some of the questions about Jesus' ideas of justice, was Jesus' idea of justice social? John MacArthur doesn't like the, the notion of social justice. In other words, did Jesus have to do with down-to-earth issues like poverty and economics? Like common human needs of food and shelter? Did Jesus' justice include or have a political aspect, political justice? Or was biblical justice, as John MacArthur and seven other uh, pastors who signed it, 7,000 other pastors who signed this, was it really connected with how to get to heaven through God's justice? So for MacArthur and others, justice represents a path each individual should follow to get to heaven. That's a very narrow concept of the justice we see in the Bible. The Hebrew word for justice was originally used to indicate fair trade or equal trade. In other words, it was an economic term. Our biblical term, tzedek, tzedek, In fact, uh, this is carried over even to modern, our modern concept of justice and our court system. Lady justice is blind. Who holds the scales of justice? Now those scales of justice are metaphor, a, a metaphor for what was originally used in business and, and, and still is in some places in the world. So it begins as an economic term. The scales were used for trade, monetary measurement that was to be considered fair in the ancient world. Balanced. That's the concept of justice. And by the way, remember, justice and righteousness in the Bible are the same word, used for both. But it begins as an economic fairness between parties. So this business term ends up as one of the characteristics of God in his dealings with humans. God deals fairly, justly with us. And aren't we glad? Now, since God expects us to practice justice with, with others, what does that mean? Well, especially in an, un, an unjust world where justice is the exception to the rule in our world. Fairness is the exception. Don't expect to be treated fairly and justly all the time. In fact, in our world, we have to legislate so that people will treat each other. There has to be laws so that we're not ripped off or we don't rip each other off. That's the world that we live in. 
Powerful people, elites, in Jesus' day, in his world, had advantages over others. People, most people, did not have access to goods, to opportunities. Even the courts in the, in the ancient world, in the time of Jesus, their scales were tipped in favor of the rich and powerful. The Bible mentions this. Uh, Amos chapter 2, verse 6. They sell the just for, for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. Now what that meant was that before someone was brought into the court, and even the court of Israel, a rich person could hand the judge a pair of sandals in order that the judge would decide in favor of the rich guy. So the, uh, the Hebrew prophets are already decrying this. Where is the justice? Even in Israel. And, and by the way, one of those, the prophets, Isaiah said, when the Messiah comes, there will be judgment in favor of the poor. They were looking for somebody to come and do justice. They were looking for that guy. But I have to, we have to recognize that Jesus lived in a time that had a different political and economic system. Uh, anthropologists uh, call it an advanced agrarian society. In other words, there's no middle class. There's virtually no middle class. Most everyone, including Jesus and his family, were peasants. And most peasants, again, always came out on the short end of the stick. No one had anything in excess. You were simply trying to get, give us this day. Help us get through the day, is the prayer that Jesus suggested for most people. Now that's different from our time, and I think we have to recognize it. But still we need to be aware of the importance of justice. The Jewish Jesus inherited and embraced his traditions, concept of God's justice for the poor and needy, which was and is social justice. So let's look at some examples. Uh, Danny you know, wanted to see some more examples that we can implement in our personal as well as our, our church life. So, for example, notice that even the birth, birth announcements in the Gospels about Jesus' promise coming as the Messiah talk about <coughs> social justice. For example, Luke 1. See, do I have these? Okay, I can read it to you. Uh, Luke 1, 46 through 55. Uh, it's one of these announcements of Jesus' coming. Uh, he has brought down the mighty from their thrones. Let's talk about the coming Messiah before he's born. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things. Okay, now let me back up to what I just read. So in the announcement, uh, the birth announcements, notice that the statement about what the Messiah is going to do has both political and economic <coughs> justice. <coughs> bringing down the mighty from their thrones. It's political. Uh, and exalting those of humble estate. Justice. Uh, fill the hungry with good things. Economic justice. Real concern for people. How, how can someone possibly say that there's not a, a, an element of social justice uh, in, in, in the gospel or Jesus? Now, again from uh, Luke's gospel. Maybe that cuts up now. Yeah. Jesus comes back to his own village of Nazareth. He's asked uh, to, to uh, speak. He stands up and he quotes Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is, uh, is on me because he has anointed me 
to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. By the way, those would have been people who never got a fair trial. And to recover the sight of the blind, to set the oppressed free. In the world of Jesus, this was monumental. Not exactly like our time, but clearly a reference to the hurting people of the time. Jesus uh, has a famous sermon in Luke 6.20. If you want to mem memorize a, a verse, there's one you can memorize, right? Blessed are the poor. Now, in that culture, uh, it didn't mean, hey, you know, it's good to be poor. <laughs> it wasn't good to be poor. That's not what this verse means. Bakarios, the word for blessed, is really should be translated, how honored are the poor. In other words, how honored in God's eyes. How God cares for the poor when nobody else does. You can count on God caring for the poor. And that's good news. And that's what Jesus was saying. Now, uh, again, powerful, powerful. What an encouragement sta encouraging statement for people who lived without hope, who lived in poverty, who, who, who had to struggle for each day for survival, the destitute poor. Uh, and then, let me go to a, a, another text, Luke 6. <coughs> now again, uh, this is a sampling of what Jesus said. He said a lot about social justice or economic justice. And so he, he's, he's telling would-be uh, followers in Luke 6, begin with uh, verse 35. <coughs> and if you... You lend to those from whom you expect re repayment. Well, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. So he's, he's expecting something more from his followers. What's he expect from us or the people who are going to follow him? But love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting anything back. Anthropologists call that general reciprocity. It's, what, it's how you treat a family member. Here you go. I know you need it. I'm not expecting anything back. That was a new model for the church in dealing with the poor. Then your reward will be great. And you will be children of the Most High because He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Now, listen, if you don't get anything else out of what I say this morning, and I'm about, I, I gotta cut it off here. But get this God's justice is not only social justice, down to earth justice, but it is a product of God's mercy and love. Now let me tie that, that together. I'm going to have, uh, I had a couple other examples, Danny, but let me, uh, let me just cut to, finish with this, that statement. Uh, notice that, according to Jesus, God's justice is rooted, based, motivated by the love of God. Now why is that important for us? I would suggest this. First of all, we don't have to be against secular social justice. Hey, for those who want to help the poor and give them opportunity, give opportunities to the disadvantaged, God bless them. You know, Jesus said something, hey, if they're not against us, they're for us. Go, go for it. Help them as much as you can. But listen, motivation is key. Church. Historically, how do you get a nation or anybody to go along with equal opportunities for the poor? It's got to be legislated. It's got to be enforced. It's got to be backed up with threats and in some cases violence. A sad part of Marxism and neo-Marxism and secular, secular socialism 
is that it has to be forced, often with violence. I prefer to practice social justice because of love for Jesus. I don't need, I don't need anybody to threaten me. If, if we love God, we don't need to be threatened to help the disadvantaged. We don't need to make excuses that they can't stand on their own. It's out of compassion and love, the very love of God in our hearts, that we should be able to respond to those in need. And God help the church if it loses its heart. But God help the church if it forgets the poor. So, thank God that he inspires us to reach out, to help out, to help others. Even our enemies. Powerful? Amen. Amen.